So continuing on with our lecture about neurotransmitters and talking about these chemical messengers, um, there's a really good table here that, that I've put to, to kind of show you how some of the most well-known, well-studied um, neurotransmitters, what they do. So here you can see there's acetylcholine, dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, glutamate, GABA, and endorphins. And you can look at this table and see which ones are really responsible for what kinds of things. So dopamine, for example, is very important for things like reward um, sensations. Um, it, it, it is also very, very much involved in drug addiction. Um, so we know that anytime you have something that you really, really like, uh, let's say it's your favorite dessert or your favorite meal or something that really makes you very happy, what happens is that you actually release dopamine and it rewards your brain. And so in drug addiction, um, what we find is that this process goes a bit haywire and you can actually numb this system up significantly with um, uh, drugs that are addictive. And so you can actually affect the brain structure and chemical structure in the brain um, by using addictive drugs. So that can be very, very dangerous. We can see here serotonin is important for things like sleep. It's also associated with things like depression, uh, disorders like depression, um, and not having enough or having too much can affect um, some of your, your processes. Now, um, we can see that glutamate is typically excitatory in that it tends to send messages to cells to activate. And so um, we actually can see that this is involved in Alzheimer's as well as seizures. Um, if you have too much glutamate, too much activity, it can make your cells fire too much, activate too much. And what that does is it can lead to seizures, which seizures are just simply your cells are overreacting um, in, in particular areas. GABA is important for inhibiting messages. So this is important for basically the opposite of what glutamate does. It tells the neurons not to fire and not to work. And so um, those are also, you know, obviously very important for um, things like anxiety disorders and inhibition of particular types of things, um, of behaviors. So one thing that we find is that the connection between a particular neurotransmitter and a particular effect is not simply a one-to-one -one relationship. We, do, we would say that, for example, acetylcholine um, is important for things like learning memory and muscle contractions. But it doesn't mean that its solely job is just to you know, do memory and, and learning. We find that acetylcholine is actually very important for remaining alert. And we see that uh, glutamate is in, important for sleep. We see that dopamine uh, isn't just limited to the reward system. There are actually several different serotonin, serotonin and dopamine pathways in the brain. And if you take medication that's going to affect one system, then it's going to affect others. Think of it like a ripple in a pond. It's excuse me, not concentrated to just that one very little tiny area. It ripples out and can have an effect on a much larger surface area than, um, than where the pebble was, was thrown. So um, we have to be very, very careful about saying that things are, are very simply understood. Um, many of these neurotransmitters uh, demonstrate very complex relationships, and our level of understanding is actually quite limited in terms of uh, all the neurotransmitters in the brain. And in fact, we do not even have, um, we don't even know for a fact what all the neurotransmitters are. We have many of them categorized, but we don't know, uh, not all of them are specifically categorized um, that, you know, that are going to remain that way. Um, to give you an example of serotonin, um, we actually have 13 different receptor types um, for serotonin. Each one has a different function and how in response to a different pathway. So we can't just say simply, oh, it's affect, it's impact the amount of serotonin. We know it's going to affect emotional states. We know it's going to affect perception of sensory uh, input, and it's also going to affect sleep. But it's going to, you know, have a really complex interaction with many of our other behaviors. Now, when we look at all of this together and we look at this idea of, okay, we have neurotransmitters and we have um, particular medications, we have particular drugs, what's important is to understand how it is that certain drugs work. Um, and if a, a drug can cross what we refer to as the blood-brain barrier, not all drugs can cross into the brain. 
um, there are very specific filters in place in the brain so that it doesn't so it doesn't have something that can come across and actually harm it. So there are particular uh, drugs, there's particular medications that can cross into the brain and actually affect mood and behavior. Um, and it, in they t typically work by interfering with the function of neurotransmitters uh, in the synapse, and they can work at different levels. So we can see that some drugs will increase a neurotransmitter or decrease a neurotransmitter uh, that are released by neurons. We can see that some um, will actually block um, the, uh, the neurotransmitters from uh, being received into the, the receptors. And then we can also see that they can mimic um, particular neurotransmitters. And the mimicking actually comes in two major categories. We have an agonist, which will bind to a receptor and mimic that it is a particular receptor, uh, a, a neurotransmitter. And then we have an antagonist, which actually fits into the receptor and blocks uh, or prohibits a response to the cell. So we're gonna kind of show, I'm gonna show this to you at the, uh, at, the, um, at the synapse level. So just to give you an idea of what an agonist is. So an agonist would be something like nicotine. So nicotine is a stimulant and nicotine in its structure, nicotine is in um, like cigarettes, for example. Um, so uh, nicotine looks very similar, is a very similar structure to acetylcholine. So what nicotine does is it binds to uh, acetylcholine receptor sites and it stimulates the receptor, uh, it, it stimulates the skeletal muscles and it can cause the heartbeat to, to the heart to beat really rapidly. So here, if we look, if, if you, um, Remember on the table in the previous slide, acetylcholine is important for skeletal muscle. It's important for um, the, the muscle contraction. So if a particular uh, a drug, in this case nicotine, is mimicking acetylcholine, then it's going to have that kind of effect on muscles. And so in this case, it's an agonist. It occupies this nicotine occupies the acetylcholine receptors because it looks so much like it in terms of structure. And then it causes things like your heart to beat more rapidly. Uh, it causes you to feel um, uh, sped up okay, because it is a stimulant. Now, an antagonist example would be something like naloxone. So naloxone is what we refer to as an opioid uh, um, agonist. So um, essentially what it does is it blocks um, endorphin receptors uh, and in, because if you take the drug if you take an opioid so let's say you take um, something like um, a a pain medication so let's say you take um, what would be uh, my brain's just not working today um, let's say you take oxycodone Okay. Um, if you take oxycodone, oxycodone is an opioid, and that is going to um, bind to an endorphin receptor. Okay. Um, and so, uh, or, or an opioid receptor. And so what naloxone does is it is an antagonist. And so it is going to block the endorphin receptors, which means that it can uh, stop in its tracks an opioid overdose. So if you take oxycodone, you take too much. If you take heroin, um, if you take uh, any sort of other kind of opioid and you're in the middle of a, um, an overdose and, and somebody administers naloxone um, to you uh, fast enough, then it can actually stop an overdose in its tracks because it's stopping all of the opioids from, from uh, connecting to those receptor sites. So when we look at, for example, addiction, addiction we can see uh, as uh, you know, the uh, activation of the brain's opioid system. And so we see, for example, exercising, people can actually be addicted to exercising because when you exercise, you release, release endorphins and then people can actually get high, excuse me, off of that. Um, because they're actually uh, exercising so much that they're getting high off of that exercise, so quote-unquote high. 
Um, but it's the same system. It's the same system as we see in addictive drugs. It's the same sort of process. Um, so those individuals who are getting that feeling that high, okay, those endorphins are the same uh, neurotransmitters that we see uh, affected by, uh, for example, uh, opioids. So these systems are all the same systems in our brain that are reacting. We, ha in, we, we make what we call um, endogenous uh, um, uh, endorphins. We make endogenous neurotransmitters, and, and so it mimics a lot of times some of the drugs that, that we take. Um, so a person can actually be addicted to something like exercise because of the amount of endorphins that are released, which um, demonstrate sort of the same sort of effect that we would see in, in drug use. So I want to show you this at the synapse level. So this would be the presynapse here, okay? So here's the presynapse. Here's the vesicles that contain the neurotransmitters, okay? And so once the signal is sent through and the vesicles open and cross this synaptic cleft here, okay, um, they then need to be taken up by the postsynaptic cell here. Okay. So these are where the receptors are, are housed. Okay. Now, when we look at the different types of drugs, we can see drugs that can mimic. Okay. So they can serve as agonists. Okay. They can mimic those, those neurotransmitters and fit into the receptors, pretending to be the drug and uh, pretending to be the neurotransmitter. So the drug can actually fit on here. Okay. Um, and then you see more of the chemical coming in. We can see that the uh, drugs can block the site and not allow it to continue to, to, to open. So they're actually blocking that through and saying, no, you can't come in. Okay, so it can block it, inhibit it. And then also we can see something which is really interesting called uh, blocking reuptake. So let's just say we have this, these chemicals, these neurotransmitters, and they're sitting in the synaptic cleft and they are just, they can't get into the receptors. So they need to go somewhere. So what happens is, is if these are blocked, these neurotransmitters actually get reabsorbed into the cell. Sometimes we don't want that to happen. So in the case of depression, for example, we know that depression, some types of depression are actually caused by serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter, by not having enough of it. And so if you don't have enough serotonin, and your body is, your brain is normally functioning, it releases the serotonin and it sits in it and it um, kind of floats around in the synaptic cleft. And let's say this, you don't have enough receptors for it. Then what it's gonna do is just gonna reabsorb back into the cell and it's not gonna go anywhere. And so that leaves you with less serotonin because your cell that's releasing, it's just absorb, reabsorbing it and nothing's happening. What you need is the next cell to get more serotonin. So one of the drugs that we have is called an SSRI. An SSRI is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. It's a reuptake inhibitor. So what it does is it actually blocks the sending cell from reabsorbing it. And when it does that, that means there's more serotonin floating around in here, forcing this cell to take it in. So when you block the reuptake, it can't reabsorb back in the cell. There's more serotonin hanging out in the synaptic cleft, and then it's forced to open some of these receptors. It spends more time in that area so that more of the receptors, maybe back here, can go ahead and pick those serotonin uh, chemicals up. So the, the, the good thing is, is that a, a reuptake inhibitor can allow for more neurotransmitter to be absorbed by the next cell. So that's pretty much the end to the microscopic stuff. Next, we're going to go to um, the central nervous system as a whole. And so we're gonna start that um, next class. So if you have any questions, feel free to email me or to bring them with you in class. Um, and we will go over those, in, um, uh, those questions that you have in class.